months versus two years on calorie restriction. And so we all know this idea that the blue is the health span, the lifespan is the whole era, and the red is that period of time where we're in the wheelchair drooling and everybody just wishes that we would exit. I didn't say that. <laughs> so we want to be that fun guy who's living life large and long and then quickly makes it sense. Uh, what's at the core of age and inflammation? You know, sometimes when we talk about inflammation, we talk about it as a secondary effect. Like there are these problems and then inflammation starts and then cardiovascular disease gets worse and get plaques and stuff. But inflammation is right at the core of aging and inflammation is generated and propagated through, uh, throughout aging. Inflammation, when we talk about senescent cells, something has gone in and damaged uh, a cell, often causing telomere attrition, resulting in mitochondrial dysfunction, and the shifting of the cell into the senescent uh, phenotype, the secretory associated senescent phenotype. And what do we mean by secretory? Well, it turns out those senescent cells are releasing fields of inflammation diffuse fields of inflammation, which recruit other cells into senescence as well. And so there's a propagating field of inflammation and those senescent cells stop reproducing. And there are two ways that we can stop this. We can reverse the senescence, we can clean up the terrain, and if the cell hasn't gone too far into senescence, we can reverse that. Or if it has gone far, we can kill off the senescent cells. And a lot of the compounds that we use in this supplemental approach to this, have multiple activities. So quercetin, for example, is well known as a senolytic, but it's also a NRF2 upregulator, it's an AMPK activator, and a sirtuin activator. Uh, and so it does so many different things to counteract this inflammation. So in inflammation of age, they have this term inflammation. And inflammation is just core to uh, the process of aging. Uh, NF kappa B is one of the major things that is uh, considered the culprit of inflammation. But really, it goes beyond that. As we induce a cell into senescence, it's releasing a number of different inflammatory compounds. Uh, and the interesting thing is, all of those are released from the mitochondria. And so, as we go through learning, you know, the art and science of aging and age management, we see that, yes, inflammation is this language of a negative direction of aging. And at the core, the sort of speaker of all of these things, whether the language is good and beneficial and that's energy and ATP, or whether the language is negative as inflammation, the core actor is the mitochondria. And so every one of these spokes of that longevity wheel eventually go down to mitochondrial health or mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, you know, or you know, replacing uh, mitophagy, replacing a old mitochondria, and we're going to see that there's this sort of you know directional thing. You can go the good direction or the bad direction, and the good direction is associated with things like sirtuins and foxes. There's a, these are these longevity genes that lead us into a cardiometabolically efficient mode of being. And then there's the opposite way, the inflammaging way. And the inflammaging way, the reason that we even do it is it because it's associated with survival. It's associated with when we have limited periods of time, we graze on lots of food, we're supposed to inflame and get fat, and then run out of food and fast it away and go back into that clean space. So we see that there's this little war going on between NF kappa B and the sirtuins, where NF kappa B can move you into senescence and suppress sirtuins. But sirtuins, when they're active and they're up on top of the game, are suppressing NF kappa B. So who is going to win? Who is going to get on top? And this is the, you know, who wins this fight? Which path wins is the 
is the result of multiple different things that you're doing, from the supplements you're taking to the diet that you're eating and all of the lifestyle act and, uh, your activity and your exercise. Uh, so as long as you can stack a couple of things together, you'll stay on the right side. And as we said, the mitochondria are core to this whole thing. So here we have this paper, Insights into the Role of Mitochondria in Aging Mitochondrial Dynamics. And there's this homeostatic mechanism where there's always this oxidative stress and oxidative defense. You know, oxidative stress comes on you like when you work out, and there's a burst of oxidative stress. And you are supposed to respond to that by upregulating your antioxidant activity. That's through the agency of this nuclear transcription factor called NRF2. Or you exercise and you burn up your free ATP and you activate AMPK, the AMP kinase, to mobilize stored glycogen, increase insulin sensitivity so you can use better the sugar you have, and of course uh, stimulate glycolysis and move fatty acids to go into ketones. So that's what's supposed to happen, but when the stressors get on top of the defenses, you head into mitochondrial damage. And when you have the damaged mitochondrial, you lose the electron transport chain activity, you lose the polarity of the membrane. Membrane polarity is the key to power in the system. And we'll see when we talk about the supplement deck, we use a lot of phospholipid and other phospholipids to build membrane power. In fact, you know, the whole measure of a mitochondria is the, the membrane potential of the mitochondria. When the membrane potential goes, then the mitochondria aren't able to hold together the electron chain or chain to make energy, and instead they make free radicals. So then respiration goes down, calcium regulation goes away. Calcium regulation is a membrane-defined regulation, and when there's damage to the membranes, you start getting the lack of compartmentalization of calcium, where calcium starts building up on the inside of the cells, propagating inflammation, leading to cell death and aging. So, now I want to step back and talk about measures for outcomes. And so, uh, Dr. Schwartz went through all the data that's there around calorie restriction. We know that calorie restriction works. Now, what are the different ways to measure this rate of aging, and are we getting on top of the situation and slowing the rate of aging? So, many years ago, uh, in 2013, uh, Horvath released a epigenetic aging clock that measured your biological age versus your chronological age. And so, you could be 53 like me, but you could have a biological age of 43 or 40, and that meant that the, everything was really working very well and you were aging very slowly. And so that's an absolute epigenetic age measure. But it really takes a long intervention, usually, to get a shift in that. And recently, there's an algorithm. All of these are part of this epigenetic measurements looking at methylation on CB, CPG islands, which are loci within the chromosome. And they have a rate of change that is uh, proportional to aging, and so uh, you were looking at a rate of change in these. Now, recently they came up with this algorithm called the Dunedin Poem. Like, who names these things? Well, some Kiwis did, because there's some tropical paradise in New Zealand called Dunedin. So they must, they must, you know, uh, they must have very young people there. I'm not, not really sure. And the Poem is pace of aging. And you also see this called the Dunedin pace plot. Uh, and it's better than some of the other algorithms uh, because it's better at det det detecting change early on, it's better for looking at personalized interventions, and it's more sensitive to short changes. Now, when they were developing this, it was developed between Duke, Columbia, and the University of Otago. And they theorized that they would be able to get a group of 30-year-olds together and look at the different rates of aging and be able to measure them. Now, traditional 
uh, reviewers at the National Institute of Aging believed that they would not be able to see significant variations among 30-year-olds, but in fact, they did. Now, this is a computer simulation, but you know how it is. You know, here is an average woman super well taken care of or very poorly taken care of. Uh, a man, average, super well taken care of, poorly taken care of, all the same age, one with average aging, one with slow aging, one with fast aging. And so, what they were getting at is that these cases of aging and rates of aging that we're thinking about now with ourselves and our clients when we're 40, 50, 60 years old, Actually, these things start a lot earlier. So the original idea was that you get up to 50 or 60 and disease just sets in and, you know, soon you die. And then there was these ideas that early life adversity may uh, lead to disease in midlife, uh, leading to a shortening of your health span. And so now they're very clear that early life uh, um, adverse, adversity accelerates aging and it accelerates disease and disability and frailty. So basically, from a young age, we're determining if we're going to go all the way out here with the health span or not go that far with the health span. And this algorithm was able to see this very clearly. And the algorithm, you know, they use the, they talk about training or calibration of the algorithms. And you'll see these relationships between the pace of aging and balance, so more balance, slower aging, less balance, more rapid aging. Uh, they calibrated it to grip strength, which is very classically used in aging studies. Uh, cognitive decline, IQ change from childhood to age 85. Uh, the faster you're aging, the faster the cognitive decline is. Of course, we saw facial aging. Facial aging is very tightly correlated to pace of aging. And even the volume of the brain is strongly correlated to the pace of aging. So they figured this out and they then wanted to test it. They tested it uh, against a cohort of 55 or 45 year olds. Uh, they also uh, was used in the calorie trial, which is a two year caloric restriction trial. Uh, restriction trial, and also in, unfortunately, uh, a study of early life adversity. And so they saw very clearly that among 40 or 5 year olds, uh, that there's a big implication for future frailty and risk. And so as we get into these things, uh, we're going to see that they're going to have implications on our uh, on our healthcare system and our insurance system, and uh, policy may come along with that. Now, I said, unfortunately, they were able to show, show changes. This was among family level socioeconomically disadvantaged children, had a statistically faster rate of aging. These were nine year old kids. And even just living on neighborhood level socioeconomic uh, disadvantages. So you can think, yeah, that, that's happening at a dietary level because they're not eating very well, but it's happening very strongly at a stress level as well. And so even at that age, we can see those changes in the rate of aging. Now, the calorie trial. Uh, you know, they did a 25% caloric restriction over two years and we're measuring uh, the rate of aging. And so this graph is basically, you've got people who aren't on, this is ad libitum, uh, this is their epigenetic age before and after, and this is slower movers and then the faster agers. But under caloric restriction, this was strongly collapsed. And the ones that might have been faster were kind of, uh, you know, slowed down quite a bit. So there wasn't so much difference between the faster or slower aging groups, and there was a low rate of aging over this trial. Now, what they could not see up here is any significant change in the Horvath clock, even at 12 or 24 months. So the absolute biologic age or epigenetic age did not go backward. Whereas the due to pace algorithm, even at 12 months, showed a significant change uh, and then continued that over 24 months. 
All right, so now to roll back quickly through uh, the longevity bill and see how we put together the protocol. Uh, if we go back over those, NRF2 and AMPK. NRF2 is more environmental detox. It's turning up your chemo prevention system. Now that can be endogenous. It can be free radical generation, uh, but it can also be all of your environmental toxins that are coming. NRF2 is what comes up and turns up all the detoxification chemistry, the enzymes, the primary molecules, the transport system to get stuff out. And MK, on the other hand, is a little bit more towards this cardiometabolic strength, but it brings with it autophagy, and that is the inner or biological cleanup. When you've got a toxin in you, you got some mercury in you, you want to get it out, it goes to NRF2. But if you have a dysfunctional mitochondria, you're not just going to leave that in there, you're not going to kill the whole cell. You want to just disassemble that one mitochondria and then replace it through mitochondrial biogenesis with a new one. So the autophagy process comes with AMPK. And as we'll see later on, it's a little bit hard to disengage even AMPK and NRF2. So NAD, NAD was the darling molecule for the last couple of years, bring it up with an NMN, nicotinamide like mononucleotide, or nicotinamide like riboside. Uh, bringing N NAD up is crucial for driving mitochondrial health, uh, but also for driving all of those anti-aging enzymes, proteins, genes, things like sirtuins. They're driven by NAD. And in fact, uh, maintenance of epigenome is driven by NAD. So it's one of the most important molecules there is. Uh, AMPK starts to encode for better metabolism. It's more of an immediate switch, but then the sirtuins are, or let's say AMPK initiates the more clear metabolism, but the sirtuins are then encoding them and keeping the system into this high efficiency network. The sirtuins are deacetylases. And there's all these protein targets that are either on or off when they're acetylated or deacetylated. And the healthy longevity and healthy cardiometabolic proteins are all deacetylated to be active and acetylated to be inactive. Whereas things like P53, which promotes senescence, some of these uh, some of these are cancer control mechanisms, like senescence. If it, you know the cell's worried it's going to go into cancer, and so it just shuts things down. Uh, those are all on acetylated proteins. So sirtuins are shifting us over to this high efficiency. Uh, neuroendocrine, uh, everybody knows that's a core part uh, of aging. And then telomeres and senolytics are more about addressing accumulated damage to the system. So a toxin gets into the system, gets past that RF2, damages the telomere, it generates senescence. So these are accumulated damages, whereas NRF2 is there to prevent that from happening in the first place. So you can look at this like two different triangles. There's the uh, protection and repair side, NRF2 and AMPK, trying to keep everything clean, uh, and the accumulated damage in the telomeres uh, and the sirtuins. And then there's the powering up and elevating the system, keeping NAD up, getting over into sirtuin dominance, and keeping a very healthy neuroendocrine system. And when we look at neuroendocrine health, it is tightly, tightly controlled by mitochondrial health. That neurotransmitter health is tightly controlled by mitochondrial health. All of the glands working together in you know, HPA, HPC, HPG axes, they are all regulated by healthy mitochondria. But up at the top of it all is NRF2, and NRF2 and NPK uh, have relationships to every single one of these folks. So arguably, this is the most important part, and this is where we start, and we start here, and then we can unfold through the wheel. So NRF2, uh, I think we heard some of these terms uh, like proteostasis. Uh, nutrient sensing. When NRF2, here we have redox regulation by NRF2 in aging and disease, and they say redox regulation because all of your antioxidant activity is under the domain of NRF2. Glutathione synthesis, glutathione recycling, 
uh, NADPH recycling, uh, superoxide dismutase, and detoxification is within that. Detoxification is part of the antioxidant system. So when NRF2 goes down, you have things like loss of proteostasis, genetic instability, telomere attrition, uh, and different epigenetic alterations, moving down into mitochondrial dysfunction, the dysregulated nutrient sensing, and cellular senescence, uh, and then all of that leading to stem cell exhaustion, when the stem cells essentially uh, become, uh, become senescent and stop working and alter intracellular communication. So once NRF2 goes down, you have no ability to maintain all of these good things, and it's like a house of cards and everything falls from there. NRF2, I've been lecturing on it for years because I was supposed to be a mercury detox guy, and it is the master regulator of detoxification, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and cytoprotective mechanisms. And that is, is really, really a core thing to protect you. Now, the way it works inside a cell, uh, if this is the nucleus and the circle here, on the outside are a pair of proteins, KEEP1 and NRF2. KEEP1 is holding or keeping NRF2 out there. And then certain enzyme inducers come in and change, you see these SHs up there. These SHs up there, I'm running out of battery here. Uh, those get oxidized to disulfide bridges and release NRF2 and it goes into the nucleus. It's called the nuclear transcription factor. Nuclear transcription factors are controlling what genes get transcribed and turned into proteins and activity in the cell. And so each of the transcription factors goes after families of genes. The family of genes here all have a promoter region called the antioxidant response element. And those are genes for all these, uh, for antioxidants, modulating enzymes, detoxifying enzymes, molecular chaperones. Chaperones are helping us make sure that our proteins are folded correctly. And uh, part of the, part of the uh, healthy anti-aging uh, or healthy aging mechanism is cleaning up old misfolded proteins. It's called the unfolded protein response. And that's partially under the domain of NRF2 and partially under the domain of the sirtuins. But all these lead to detoxification of electrophilic and electrophiles and free radicals, radicals, removal of oxidatively damaged proteins leading to cell survival. Now, interestingly, most of the NRF2 work was done in cancer journals. This is in mutation research, but you'll find tons of it in carcinogenesis. Because when these mechanisms go down, then these environmental toxins very quickly become carcinogens and you can very quickly move into uh, cancer and one of your mechanisms when you don't have control and you might be developing cancer is to go into senescence. So you can see how this failure to keep the primary cleaning going on leads to this decay of the cell. And within the demand of NRF2 is this system that is a chemoprotection system. It's got antioxidant detoxification and protein repair mechanisms in it. And in its core are these things that we think of as the heroes, like glutathione, thyroidoxin, like hog acid. But all of these are not activated, or they're not acting on you until they go through the agency of these different enzymes. You have antioxidant enzymes like glutathione peroxidase that, uh, that quenches free radicals using electrons from glutathione. Then your glutathione is uh, oxidized and needs to be re-reduced by glutathione reductase. So all of these enzymes are part of this intricate system to keep the cell clean, keep the redox, uh, the redox balance in the right space, in a reducing space, and, uh, and keep the cell moving in, with high efficiency. And when you look at things like uh, <coughs> You know, one of the primary targets of mercury, cadmium, and arsenic is the mitochondria. And in fact, the glutathione system in the mitochondria actually has to get tuned more to deal with ox oxidative stress because of respiratory bursts and becomes more sensitive to the effects of the heavy metals. So it's important to have your whole cellular glutathione working and keeping things out. In fact, glutathione, NRF2, if you inhibit it, uh, many environmental toxins trigger very strong diseases. So this is a neurodegenerative model of Parkinson's 
And uh, NRF2, if NRF2 is inhibited, then methylmercury turns these little worms into Parkinson's worms. But if NRF2 is working, then that doesn't happen. So we're, we're exposed to toxins all the time, quite a few of them. And if our system is working, we don't have to have strong consequences. We're just gonna move that stuff out. And unfortunately, if this stuff goes down with age, uh, there is a natural rhythm of NRF2 upregulated, and it decreases with age, but it can be brought back up to younger levels with things like lipoic acid, quercetin, things that are NRF2 upregulators. Now, quercetin and lipoic acid, I really like because they're tubers. They give you NRF2 activity, but they're also PGC1 alpha activators, so they generate more mitochondrial biogenesis. So what upregulates NRF2? Well, primarily polyphenols and sulfur compounds. The sulfur compounds would be like our lipoic acid and sulfurophate. But naturally in your body, it's reactive oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur species that are accumulating that NRF2 reacts to and brings up the system to clean those away. So now we shift over to AMPK. Here we have AMPK at the nexus of energetics and aging. And AMPK has all these things under its domain. Let's go to this other one, it's a little bit easier. AMPK, it's this fed fasted thing going on. So when you're fasted or carb restricted, you activate AMPK. So here we have AMP buildup, we have exercise, we have liver kinase B1, which is where nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals come in and act. This is where metformin acts, this is where resveratrol acts, this is where berberine acts to activate AMPK. And what that does is block fatty acid synthesis, activate adipose triglyceride lipase, which is digesting fats and turning them into ketones, and blocks protein synthesis, which is blocking mTOR, and activating the OK1, which is activating autophagy. Now, autophagy through mTOR blocking is the deepest level of detoxification. That is where we're taking whole organelles or whole cells. We are putting them into something called an autophagosome and digesting them down to their uh, primary components. Now, why would it be activated during fasting? What did you activate during fasting? You activated lipolysis to move fat out for energy, and the autophagy then is going to take old damaged proteins, recycle them back into amino acids, and recycle your decrepit parts. It's our internal recycling system, and it's very important. And how do we know which ones to get? Damaged membranes on the organelles accumulate tags, which are then called into the autophagosome. And so a damaged mitochondria will be digested, not a good one, so it's pretty good. So in the realm of autophagy, we have mitophagy, lipophagy, which is burning fats, endoreticulophagy. Anyone want to say that 10 times? I'll give him a blue sign. <laughs> and that's your the class of reticulum, and xenophagy. You take viruses, bacteria, parasites, put them into autophagosomes, start breaking them up so you can make antibodies specific to their cell membranes and cell parts. So at the deepest level of immunity, there's AMPK. And of course, to drive immune cells, what do you need? You need energy, so you need healthy uh, ATP generating mitochondria. Now AMPK, because of this ability to burn up fatty de deposits and induce autophagy is a target for helping block or reverse fibrosis or even fatty liver. So they have uh, viruses and toxins and fatty liver all driving the fibrosis, and then they have uh, these uh, you know, nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals, metformin, fenofibrate, uh, adiponectin is something you make when you fast, uh, curcumin, endocytins, all those driving the other way. So this is a big target. And I'm going to skip through some of these so we can get a little bit of speed, but there's an interesting part of this. When you have enough inflammation in the liver and you're moving into fibrosis, you actually get something called leaky liver. And you're losing membrane integrity in the liver. In fact, membrane integrity, integrity in the GI, in the liver, in the blood-brain barrier is sirtuin and AMPK and thus NAD dependent. So all of these things are tightening up the ship for us. The inflammatory weight gaining way is one of loosening 
breaking apart, you're getting endotoxemia, you're getting leaky blood brain barrier, you're just dissolving the whole system. The other direction, high NAD, AMPK, NRF2, sirtuins, is tightening everything up, tightening the ship and increasing your ability to compartmentalize, which is a big thing of driving power in the system, is compartmentalizing things to turn the whole biology into a battery. And along with uh, AMPK activation, you have a number of these are changes in the liver. Uh, and here we have bile salts being AMPK activators, and you're blocking anabolism, increasing metabolism, and in, in the liver, you're creating more cell polarization, so the membranes are getting polarized. You're increasing tight junction formation, uh, cytoskeletal organization, and canalicular trafficking. I didn't think I was going to get out here. I was in TSA, I was flying out here, I'm flying out from Denver, and these guys pick me up from TSA, and all of a sudden I'm with a bunch of federales, and they're accusing me of cantilicular trafficking. <laughs> What's cantilicular trafficking? It's bioflow. Bioflow is where all toxins go. Bioflowing out of the liver is actually the river of toxin drainage from the liver. And so in a healthy liver, Everything is fed in on the left side and the basolateral side. You have toxins and your bile salts harvested from the GI coming in, going through any changes they have to have, and dumped out through MRP2 and PSA. These are bile and toxin transporters, and then MBR is a phosphatidylcholine transfer uh, transporter that keeps all that bile flow going. So we're trying to keep everything moving this way. Unfortunately, when we get inflammation, all this gets blocked. So, uh, NPK activation and NAD supplementation refers to fatty liver. There's a lot of data around that. And NPK and NRF2 are brothers. When NPK activation is high, NRF2 activation is high. So these two go together. So detoxification and fasting, uh, NPK drivers and detoxification drivers and intermittent fasting, all those should go together for the most powerful effects. So, in one of these formulas that we used, uh, we have a combination of things that are more traditional plants for driving bioflow, myrrh, gentian, dandelion, solidago, PC, along with these NRF2 upregulators, quercetin, luteola, dim, lipoic acid, and silymer. If you bring all these together and you do them in a uh, nanoparticle delivery, you can affect movement of toxins from the cell to the liver, out to the bile, into the GI, where you can pick them up then. Now, also, these things are also AMPK activators, so we're getting all these effects at one point. Uh, and there's a study done using this method uh, by Chen Wan down at Texas Lifestyle Medicine uh, Institute, and they had about 80% 80, 80 resolution of fatty liver diagnosed by ultrasound and blood markers using just this combination of bioflow, NRF2, and AMPK activators along with a toxin binding group. And it was only one to two method, one to two months to get all this effect. And uh, a lot of these were toxic exposed people, leaving them in the fatty liver and just moving all this out really brought everything back. So then in this 40 person study, which I'm gonna have to fly through really quick, uh, we took 40 people, we put them on a three month protocol, we did the epigenetic age class uh, before and after. In month one, we did this liver draining uh, nano emulsion blend with a toxin binder, a liposomal glutathione. Glutathione works on all those detox pathways and helps augment what you're already making, uh, and a liposomal cat's claw to help work against any accumulation of like viruses like Epstein Barr and cytomegalovirus because they down regulate NRF2 and AMPK. So that was one month to start draining things. The second month, we took that liver blend out and we put an AMPK uh, and sirtuin activating blend. Still had some NRF2 activity, but it was mostly AMPK and sirtuins. And then we added in nicotinamide mononucleotide and a liposome along with some methylated B vitamins. When you're driving NAD, you have to support methylation because NAD uh, metabolism uses SAMe building up homocysteine, so you just gotta turn that wheel. Uh, and then we started adding uh, membrane support then, uh, is, uh, as well as the toxin binder. All right, and then the last month, we just took the toxin binder out and we kept going with the NAD, the membranes, 
uh, the AMPK sirtuin activation uh, and added in a multivitamin. And so all this together, and you know, I mentioned the membrane building, we use a lot of phosphatidylcholine membranes are super important. It's not just your cell membrane. Endoplasmic reticulum is actually the quarterback of the whole cell. It exchanges communication with the cell membrane, with the mitochondria, with the Golgi apparatus, and brings all those signals into the nucleus to decide, decide on what genes can be transcribed. So getting power, you need to do that. All right, so we put them through three months of this, measured the epigenetic absolute age, and uh, the absolute age, this PC intrinsic there, uh, right here, that's the Horvath clock. We had a highly significant reversal of about a year of age over three months, and we had a highly significant slowing of the rate of aging. It was even stronger than the calorie trial, and we did this in three months. So now you know, we have proof that we can use these compounds as calorie restriction memetics to change the rate of aging. And the other thing that we saw, one of the hugest things in aging is immunosenescence. And you're losing, uh, you're losing B cell production, your natural killer cells are losing power even though you're getting more of them, the T lymphocyte populations are changing. And uh, what we saw in the epigenetic markers was the significant positive shift in natural killer cells, in B cells, and in monocytes. So we know now we have ways to work, some are lifestyle, some are nutrition, and some are supplementation to increase the health span and probably increase the total lifespan. And then we can use these epigenetic age clocks before and after our interventions and see what direction everything is going for us. So I will stop with that and thank you for your time and attention. Speaker. We have no moderators here.